the intuitive nature of us is going, I got to close a deal. And the only them, yep, my personality, the only way to get them is to go, I'm the greatest. And here's why. And here's why my services are better. And it's actually, that's not what's going to attract people at all. What's going to attract people is caring about them. From Reminder Media, this is Stay Paid, a sales and marketing podcast on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business. Hosted by the VP of Marketing, Josh Steik, and Reminder Media's president, Luke Akery. So get ready to hear the golden nuggets that will allow you to live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. All right, welcome to another episode of Stay Paid. Today, we're going to talk about probably one of the most important topics and important questions that we get most of all, and that's how do you find and close prospects? That's pretty much literally the point of this I've got my cell phone notepad out because I'm going to take notes. And to do that, we're going to be talking with one of the top financial advisors in the country today. Before we introduce her, though, I just want to remind everybody, great way to support the show. We really, really appreciate it. Head on over to YouTube and search for Reminder Media. So we actually put all of our state paid podcast videos on Reminder Media because that's the company that pays for all of these podcasts. <laughs> so go ahead and head on over there and subscribe to get all of the YouTube videos. But the most important way is to download and subscribe on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. So yes. we're, uh, it really helps us out with our chart positions. And we have a goal to reach number one in marketing by the end of this year. We and we're running out of time. Months left. So if you can, even if you listen to this in Spotify or you listen to it on our website, we would really appreciate the support. If you love the show and you love what we bring in you for free, just go over iTunes, yep. subscribe there and download from there. If you're on your phone, if you have an Apple phone, it's Apple Podcasts. So it's kind of weird if it's on your computer, it's iTunes. On your phone. Well, the highest we've hit this year is 14. Yeah. Over the weekend, I think we hit 18. Yeah. And then we keep resting at that 33 to 27 spot. That's well, where we keep resting. It's a, a busy time times. right now in our business it's and nice excuse. In the it's a busy time. People are busy. <laughs> well, they're not busy for the number one right now. They're <laughs> somebody's getting that number one spot. <laughs> No, I'm trying to segue you into a little bit of business yes, talk. Yeah, yeah, What's okay. going on in Reminder yeah. Media? Reminder Media. So Josh is referring to our craziest season of all, which yeah. we call busy season. That's why in we're fact, slightly it's the game, right yeah, now. Yeah, it's the Game of Thrones <laughs> reference. Winter is coming. Every year with Reminder Media, we're like, winter's coming. Because our most popular issue at Reminder Media for our magazine, which is our flagship product, so we do a customizable magazine for businesses to send as a touch point, is our holiday issue. And it it goes freaking bonkers. Like it is like flying off the shelves, as they would say. Like we we break records in sales. Everybody wants to get in. It is a crazy time. And it got it gets everybody so stressed. But it's the happiest time of year, too, because when the clients it's the time are in the office, it, we're loving when it. we used to be in the office, it would be the time where like your job was just to keep everyone from not killing each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, correct. Because it's so crazy. And now everybody's at <laughs> in home. In a good way, because so many people are getting signed up yeah. and, are, and are getting something out for the holidays. A beautiful, so, a beautiful piece for the holidays. Yeah, it's it's crazy times, though. Well, our guest today, her name is Erin Botsford. She is a 30-year veteran of the financial services profession. She was a Barron's top 100 advisor in all categories, advisor, independent, and women. Erin successfully sold her practice in 2017 and now provides advisors the ability to model her success through her elite advisor success system and spend the day mastermind programs. She also donates half of the profits from all her training courses to support orphans helped by the Ebenezer Foundation and Orphanage in Livingston, Zambia. Aaron, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, guys. I'm glad to be here. It's awesome to have you, Aaron. I'm really looking forward to this interview. I know not only, obviously, are you coaching people to do this, but you're a practitioner. I got the privilege of hearing you on a webinar and hearing you speak, and I thought so many of the things and tips that you gave to people were super practical. I would love for you to introduce kind of yourself to the audience and just share a little bit about your journey, what led you to be an advisor and that kind of trajectory there, and then ultimately, what's led you to coaching advisors and what you're doing today? So my journey um, started off rather rough. Uh, I was raised um, in, I'll call it poverty, it didn't start out that way. My father actually uh, was a professor of uh, his PhD at Northwestern University in Chicago. And unfortunately, when I was 11, he died of a massive heart attack and left my mom with six kids and literally a $10,000 life insurance policy. So you know, even though he was highly educated, PhD, um, he was only 50 when he died and he just hadn't gotten around to that concept of financial planning, like whoever heard of that 100 years ago. So 
you know, we went from a middle class lifestyle to real poverty. And so, you know, when I was 11, I had to start working and all of us, all six kids, we'd work and we'd bring home. I babysat. I got a dollar an hour for babysitting. And we, but I put it on wow. the table at home because that's how my mom paid the bills. So, you know, I, I, had a, I got a strong work ethic out of necessity, you know, very early. And when I was 16, I was on my way to work at my first real job. I was super excited. I got a job at McDonald's. And it was the day after Thanksgiving. I was 16 years old. And unfortunately... <laughs> On the way to work, I, I was in a very bad car accident. I actually hit a guy on a motorcycle and he was killed. Mm. And as a result of that, I was charged with involuntary manslaughter. And so when you're charged with a crime, it became this just horror show. I'm just this young 16-year-old high school girl, and but you're charged with involuntary manslaughter. So we had to, I had to defend myself. And so my mother and I met with this man. They called him, he was called an attorney. <laughs> I'd never heard of an attorney before. And the interesting thing about this meeting was the words that he said to my mother, he said, Mrs. McGowan, that was my maiden name. He said, uh, you know, this is purely a matter of economics. If your daughter will just plead guilty to these charges of manslaughter, I'll be happy to enter the plea at no cost. But if you want to defend your daughter, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Mm. Well, guys, money was not a resource that we had. So my mother just literally stood up, picked up her purse shook the man's hand and said, okay, she'll plead guilty. Now, <laughs> if you can imagine, I was sitting there, you know, I, I, I tell people, I really did have like an out-of-body experience because I was listening to my mother telling this man I was going to plead guilty to killing somebody. And I was just begging her, mom, mom, I'm a good girl. I was a 4.0 student. Please help me, please, you know. And imagine being my mother and my mother looked at me and said the saddest words. She said, honey, I'm, I'm so sorry. We have no money. Mm. And therefore, we have no choice. And I always tell people that was the day I learned that money buys you choices. And don't ever forget it. Mm. Now, the good news was, you know, we went home. And my older brothers and sisters, they were talking about me like I wasn't even there. And my older brother, Tammy, was all of 22 years old at the time. He said, mom, mom, we can't let her plead guilty to killing somebody. She'll be screwed up for the rest of her life. And so." Thank God he had the, he'd just gotten a real estate license. And so he told my mom, let's put a second mortgage against our home and pay for Aaron's defense, which we did. And as a result, I was found not guilty. In fact, this kid was 18. He had borrowed the bike that morning. He'd never ridden. He was going 47 miles an hour in a 25 mile hour zone. I was going 17. And so they threw the charges out. It was clearly his fault. He hit me. I did not hit him. But, you know, wow. going through that kind of drama and trauma was just really not fun. Man. So anyway, long story short is right after the, the week after the criminal trial was over, I got a, the family of the young man. They sued my mom and me for just a ridiculous amount of money. And so we had to go through another trial. In this case, our insurance company came up, you know, came to my defense because now it's the insurance company being sued. But again, these little lessons in life, my mother, I remember she looked at me and I, I can't give my mom mother of the year award, but she's dead. So she won't hear this. Um, but imagine she looked at me and she goes, well, you know, because of you, mm. we may have to pitch a 10 on the high school football field because she thought we were going to lose the only asset we had, which was our home. So, you know, I came to this business, the financial services business. I'll tell you, I came to it pretty honestly. Um, wow. You know, I, I understand the importance of money. I understand all of that. And I'll finish up the story by saying, you know, I was very lucky. Um, the way my husband noticed me was my picture was on the front page of the newspaper. He goes, oh, my God, that girl's in my algebra class. And I have to tell you, you know, he dated and he married some pretty damaged goods. But the good news was we moved 17 times in the first 14 years we were married. He was a fighter pilot in the Air Force. And finally, when he got out, it took me 11 years and seven colleges to graduate from college. I, went, I never went to day school. I went to night school and I followed his career around. But I have to tell you guys. It was that moving around, I got to reinvent myself and I never told the story that I just told you for years and years and years. I, I wanted to sweep it under the rug and never let anybody know where I came from or what happened to me. So we got back to the US. We lived in Germany for three years and I went in, I graduated from the University of Maryland overseas campus and we got back and I went into a stock brokerage firm looking for a secretarial job because that's really... I. You know, I never thought anything of myself. I, I, you know, I was a, I was a very insecure person, and uh, 
I remember the branch manager goes, well, honey, you know, I'm going to give you a shot. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make you a stock program. Like a stock program. I mean, I don't even know what that is. I mean, I didn't know the difference between a stock, a bond, a mutual fund. You know, I, I knew nothing. And three weeks later, I was studying for my series seven. And like they say, the rest, as they say, is history. So anyway, that's, that, that's my story in a nutshell. Wow. Wow, man. Talk <laughs> about overcoming the odds and the power of, wow. Even sharing your story, I'm sure you could speak this whole podcast on the power of sharing your story and not sweeping it under the rug, because I know that affects so many people is they're ashamed of their past, they're ashamed of their story. And it really is, it's not until you flip that coin on its head going, no, 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 your story is what makes you unique. Hmm. It's what makes you who you are and embracing it doesn't mean you have to accept the bad things, right? that have happened to you or, or some dwell in that, but it really, you don't have to hide from it. So I, I think that's so powerful. So tell us, because I know you became a, a Barron's top 100 advisor. So you crushed it, obviously, um, in, in your financial advisory practice. Can you tell us just a little bit about what it took to become a Barron's top 100 advisor? And then let's get into this topic of, you know, how do you actually attract prospects and, and turn them into clients? Well, yeah, um, I struggled for about the first 10 years, I will tell you that. And, um, you know, once again, my husband, I got out of the Air Force and and we moved, I've been in business three and a half, four years, and we moved from Panama City, Florida, where I started. And think about this, guys. When I started, the average per capita income in Panama City, Florida was $9,000 a year. So I didn't have like a rich market. <laughs> but uh, what I did, what I did, what I was good at was creativity. I'm a 10 quick start. If you know the Colby test, I'm a 10 quick start. And so... Sometimes I do the ready, fire, aim, you know, regroup kind of thing. So I remember early in my career, I started giving um, seminars during the day, daytime seminars at the public library in Panama City, Florida. I had two sides to this town. One was mostly military. The other was the rich people that came down in this wintertime from Ohio and Pennsylvania and the Northeast. So I was very fortunate. I had a couple of very good mentors. One was named Hal Burleson, and I always like to give him credit because Hal was one of these guys that... When I came in and asked him a question, regardless of what he was doing, he'd take his pencil or pen and he'd just put it down and he'd stop and listen to me. And he'd only been in business a couple of years longer than I had, but he was so kind. And he really literally actually allowed me, think about this, the kindness of this. He let me actually use his entire seminar script. So here I was a competitor of his, but Hal always operated out of it, uh, uh, an abundance mentality. And so we were competing for the same few rich people, but he helped me a lot. And, that's since been one of the motivations I have for what I'm doing today is, wow, you know, I was given the gift of generosity and I've lived my life. You know, that's the only thing I want people to say about me at my funeral is that she was super generous. So, and I got that from people along the way who helped me. That's awesome. So I started doing seminars and then we moved to Dallas, Texas and I knew nobody. Well, we moved to Panama City. I didn't know anybody either. So, you know, all these people, these advisors, what I try and encourage them not to do is don't make some assumptions like, well, I have to have a market. I have to know people. I have to know rich people. No, you don't have to know anybody. Um, but you do have to put yourself out there. You do have to take chances and you do have to be uncomfortable a lot of times. And so, you know, the whole fake it till you make it worked super well for me. Mm. But the story I tell that made a huge difference because I was making a lot of excuses for my failure, to be really honest. So I enrolled in a business coaching program and because uh, I got to the point where it was like, I either have to figure this out, or I'm going to quit because just this languishing in mediocrity just wasn't, and it was just hard. I just didn't, I wasn't having any fun. I hated it. So my branch manager said, why don't you get some coaching? So I did. So everything turned around and I believe in, uh, you know, I, I believe in the universe. I pray. I, you know what? I mean, I just think that that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, whatever you want to call it. But it's the third, it's the third year of coaching, 12th session. And uh, it's time to stand up. Our coach said, stand up, find somebody in the room and compare your results. How have you done over the last three years? Well, I was super excited. And so I stood up and I found this random guy. I said, hey, do you want to do the exercise together? He's like, yeah. So I'm like, I'm going to go first. So I said, three years ago, I was doing around $300,000 in production and this year I'm on target to somewhere between 400 and 450 and I'm super happy with my progress. And I'm like, Whoa, you know, look at me. <laughs> and then it was this guy's turn. His name was Paul. 
He goes, hey, I'm Paul. Three years ago, you know, I was doing 300,000 in production as well. And I'm like, oh, wow, look at this. We're just alike. <laughs> and then he said the words I'll never forget. He goes, this year, I'm on target to do 3 million in production. And he said, I've built an entire team around me. So what I do is I go out and I, I prospect, you know, that's my role. I prospect, I bring in new business, and then I turn them over to my team. My team takes care of them. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, you went from 300,000 to 3 million in three years? He's like, yep. And then he goes, oh, and by the way, my wife, she just won the Bill Phillips Body for Life contest. So next year, I'll own a gym. <laughs> so I'll have a gym and a financial services company. And I was like, what? And, and of course, the bell rings. It's time to go back to our seats. And I'm standing there. I, I told people it was like that ALS bucket challenge moment. I'm like, and I'm thinking, <laughs> Did I miss a coaching class? I mean, I mean, it was just crazy. Yeah. So it's time to go back to my seat. I'm like, Paul, Paul, I said, could I, could I please buy, you know, an hour of your time? He goes, yeah, sure. He goes, why don't you come spend a day with me and my team? Once again, a true sign of generosity. It was amazing. I mean, I, as soon as I could get back to Dallas and I dragged my husband with me because I thought, you know what? I know this guy is going to tell me I have to divorce my husband, <laughs> you know, sell my firstborn child because whatever, you know, but it wasn't like that at all. In fact, it really, we spent the day, most of the day talking about what does it mean to own a financial services business? Mm. And so, you know, I, like I said, I have a whole, I have an entire course on the whole thing, but Needless to say, I got back. I remember going at one part-time assistant and I went to her and I said, her name is Kaylin. Now she's running a ginormous company because I, when I sold my company, she exchanged her shares into the new company. But I remember saying to her, she was 20 years old. I go, okay, I'm going to go out and bring a new business and you're going to do everything else. And she was like, okay. <laughs> so um, three years later, I did 3 million, then 4 million and my business continued to grow. And so what I learned from Paul is it's not rocket science. But it is intentionality. Mm. And so, you know, I just, whatever Paul told me to do, that's what I did. I went out and brought a new business. I built a team around me. And I think a lot of advisors, and I, I'll go back up and say the sad thing, or not, not so nice, when you're mostly in, in charge of business development and then you turn your clients over to your team, the part that I missed a lot was the client interaction. And so the way I got through that was, you know what, I would just take clients to dinner or lunch. But I didn't have to sit there and go through their balance sheet, you know, every single client, because you do limit your potential if you're sitting in those meetings. So eventually I had two offices. I had one in Dallas, I had one in Atlanta. My goal was to have seven conference rooms filled with our advisors. And I was not in any one of them. And that's that's truly what happened. So that is incredible. What a golden nugget too there when you said, I just did whatever Paul told me to. And I think a huge mistake is that um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like if you're just getting started in the business, there are successful people that have gone before you. But what is it that Kevin Harrington said when we got to interview him? It's like, be your mentor's best student. Yeah. Like be the person who's like, I'm just going to do and execute yeah, on whatever this don't person. Don't look for a mentor and then yeah. take their advice. Because, because what's going to be different is your personality, right? Your authenticity is going to be different and that's going to evolve the process. So you know, I guess dive a little deeper into this topic of uh, attracting prospects. Like how, how does one attract prospects and what were some of the things that you did and, and that you teach right now? So I'll tell you what I did and then I can, I'll, I will uh, tell you what I would be doing right now in this COVID age. Okay. So let's start off with what I did. I literally walked into the chamber of commerce in Plano, Texas, which is where my office was when we moved to Dallas. And, um, I walked in, I did not know, I, I did not know one soul. So I asked the lady behind the counter, her name is Rome, believe it or not, I said, would you have lunch with me? And I had done this in, in Panama City as well, but I was also, a, I, I had another mentor, his name is David, and he taught me this strategy. So I would take Rome, I took whoever it was I went out to lunch with, and I used the art form, it's called compliment and ask questions. And it's not, um, uh, I don't want to say it's, spurious or whatever it's it's not disingenuous but i i love people and i love hearing their stories i get truthfully i get so sick of telling my story but in this case i would invite somebody so at rome so how long have you been at the chamber and what do you do and what's the best part about what you do and it's kind of like what you're doing to me right now i did a podcast every day at lunchtime because it wasn't recorded 
And tell me about your husband and how did you meet and tell me about your kids and what do you get your hair done? Love your shoes. And when she would ask about me, I'm like, yeah, I'm a financial advisor, but let's talk about you. I just really want to spend today talking about you. Let me give you a really funny example about that. So I did that three or four days a week. At the end of those meetings, I would say, they would always say to me, oh my gosh, I've enjoyed our conversation so much. Well, the truth was we hadn't had a conversation. We'd had an interview. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but people love that. And I would tell people, I tell advisors, when was the last time somebody asked about you and allowed you and gave you the gift of talking about yourself for an hour? Mm. Think about it. So talk about a gift that you can give somebody because we're just culturally, we don't do that much, right? We, all, we want to talk about ourselves and advisors want to pull out their pitch deck and they want to talk about their business and their manager selection process and me, 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 me. But if you, it's counterintuitive, but you'll talk about them. I'll give you the example that I think is funny. So I spent a lot of time in Dallas and then I did, I started working with the executives of a very large company in Atlanta. I started with one guy. My whole life has always been about one guy, the person sitting in front of me. He was very senior level at this company. And I laugh and say, he, he ended up introducing me to 280 of his closest friends. Well, it didn't happen just like that, but he introduced me to one more and that person introduced me to one more and that person, because I did a good job for them, right? So it always starts with one person. You don't have to find a market, you have to find one person. And so, because finding a market gets overwhelming, I think. Mm. Finding one person that you can sit in front of is very easy and very manageable. But anyway, so I ended up building an office in, in Atlanta. And for 13 years, guys, 13 years, I traveled three weeks a month. I got on a plane every Monday and I came back on Thursday or Friday, three weeks a month for 13 years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and we laughed because I, my, my husband my husband was an airline pilot. I remember saying, we we're in Dallas, Texas. And he said, honey, I said, I, you know what? Why don't we just move to Atlanta, Georgia? My God, I mean, this this schedule I'm keeping up with, with our son and, you know, da, 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 da. And, and I, I go, let's just move to Atlanta. And my husband, who's so funny, he goes, well, if we move to Atlanta, then I'd have to commute. <laughs> and I go, honey, you're an airline pilot. You commute <laughs> you for a living. For a living. <laughs> but you know what? He goes, but I play golf every Saturday with Ed in Dallas, Texas. And, you know, we raised our kid. And so anyway, it wasn't going to happen. We weren't, we were but I did have a condo there and I had a car and, I'd fly in on Monday, come back on Thursday or Friday, whatever it was. Finally, in 2008, March 2008, of course, the worst time in the world to make this decision, but I didn't know it at the time. I had these people from this executive, this corporation, start off with one. I now had them, they would retire in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, and they moved. And I had them in 31 states. They would go back to whatever state they came from. So now I have clients in 31 states. And for whatever reason, in my silly mind, I felt like I needed... And they were wealthy clients. I felt like I needed to go see them at least once a year. Note to self, you know, you don't need to go see them. I finally changed, turned the table. On March 2008, I had been in seven cities in one week. I was so exhausted. Oh I came home and I said, I, I remember I called my business partner the next day. I said, I'm done. I'm never coming back. And I don't care what it costs me. Mm. I was done. Interestingly enough, nobody even noticed that I didn't go to their city and my business in Atlanta grew like tremendously. I think they did better without me, right? But once again, I found myself in 2008 starting over again in Dallas, Texas. So here's the funny story. There's a writer, a business writer. I think she's retired now, but at the time she was a big deal. And somehow I managed to figure out how to get her to to take her to lunch. So we're talking about my thing is called the out to lunch bunch. So Of course, I wanted to write a story about me. I want to get some publicity. I'm starting over. I know nobody in Dallas. All my old clients are dead or whatever. So um, I do do this. I compliment and ask questions. So tell me, I found out she just loved her daughter, her daughter, her daughter, her daughter. And her. what what was the most famous person that she's interviewed? And what was her favorite story? And she was super interesting. Loved it. Mm. Just fed my soul. She not once asked me about me, (laughs) which is fine. (laughs) at the end i got exactly what it was she goes oh erin she goes i have enjoyed this conversation so much she goes you are just such an interesting person i think i'd like to write a story about you <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> there is a huge huge valuable golden nugget there mm-hmm. when you make life about others and about relationships all of a sudden you, you become the most interesting yeah, person in the world correct to be, them <laughs> to them yeah it's it's but what you said is so true and and if you apply it to sales and marketing 
This is where salespeople die all the time is it's not intuitive because the intuitive nature of us is going, I got to close a deal. And the only press them yep, with my personality. The only way to get them is to go, I'm the greatest and here's why. And here's why my services are better. And it's actually, that's not what's going to attract people at all. What's going to attract people is caring about them yeah. and what their desires are. And occasionally you're going to have the right person at the right time where they're in the buying mode for your product and service and screaming from the rooftops that you're the greatest actually is about them because it's what they need. But most of the time that doesn't happen. The other golden nugget I want to point out to people is this idea of using your lunch in order to build relationships. We all got to eat as the saying goes. It's the why never not, eat alone. Yeah, yeah, never eat alone. Why not spend that time building relationships with the people around you and having a way to communicate with them that is very, very non-threatening. When you grab coffee with somebody, when you grab a lunch with somebody, actually for the real estate people listening to this, um, Gino uh, Bellafari or Bellafario, however you pronounce his last name, this is how he built his, he's the CEO right now for like uh, Home Services yep. of America, so Berkshire Hathaway. And it's a huge real estate company, but he built his business a, a lot of times on coffee. And he would go and interview him just like Aaron's talking about. He would ask them like 17, 18 different questions. By the end, they feel great, but he's just interviewed them the whole time and he built a whole real estate practice. So this transcends industries. So I guess let's uh, wrap up with how do you close? Like how do you convert? So you're, you're, you're building relationships. Not that we all don't want more friends. We love friends and relationships, but ultimately we want business. So how do you turn it into a, into a client? Well, first of all, I would... Um at the end of the thing, I, say, you know, I would say to them, you know, I've had, I've enjoyed this time so much. Who else, especially I didn't know anybody in town, who else in town do you think I should, you know, get to know? I would love to spend time like this with, who are the movers and shakers in town? Well, but because I gave them this gift of talking about themselves, they're like, oh, you need to, you need to meet Bob the banker and Joe the plumber and, you know, whoever it is. I said, well, would you mind introducing me? Back then it was like, you know, it was a handwritten note. Today it's an email or a text or something like that. And I would just repeat this over and over again. I built this huge database. And you're so right, Luke. It's like, here's the thing. You can't force it. In, in my business, in the financial services business, somebody has to have a triggering event in order to need my services, right? They're going to retire. They're planning for retire. They have a kid. They have a grandkid. There's something that is there. And, I, and so the, the, the art form that I teach, I created, I teach, and I use was what I do in a second meeting with people, and sometimes I even did it in a first meeting because sometimes they'd say, hey, you're, you're a financial advisor. You know, my husband and I have been talking about getting some financial advice. Um, could I bring him in or could we meet again for lunch? Yeah, sure. Well, on that meeting, what I would do is I used what I refer to as disturbing tracks. What I did effectively is I asked them questions to get them uncomfortable about their current situation and what I effectively did was create the triggering event that they didn't even know was there. Hmm. So I'll give you an example. I, taught, I have 22 of these little, let's call these paths, these tracks to go down. And depending on who was sitting in front of me, I could figure out, you know, what, what they might need. So, you know, I would, I would say, so, you know, have you guys updated your state planning, you know, rec your state planning documents recently? And they're like, now, it's been a while. I said, well, you know, just out of curiosity, let me ask you a couple of questions. And so I would ask them these probing questions very innocuously. And whatever, I, I set it up. So whatever, however they answered me, I'd go, hmm, I find that interesting. <laughs> and like, well, what? Why? <laughs> well, did you ever think about this, this, this? Well, and usually they ask people, well, how come my attorney didn't tell me that? I'm like, well, I don't know. But, you know, we could certainly get it fixed if it's a, if there's still a problem. It was always, I used more of like, my friends call it the Colombo clause. Like, hmm, I find that interesting. So what I would do is, especially if I had the husband and wife in my, my office, I had it down so well that I always closed for a new client on the first meeting. Wow. Okay, because I would hammer them, hammer them, hammer them, hammer them, hammer them. So I usually I'd wait till I saw one of them sweating. Okay. <laughs> and then I could stop and say, you know, and they're like, well, what do you stop? Why are you stopping? I'm like, well, would you like to know? Do you want me to help you get these things fixed? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and then, you know, I, well, you know, I, then it would be like, well, I've got to decide whether you're like, you're a good fit for my firm or not. Because, <laughs> you know, they had to be nice. And so the bottom line is usually, 
usually, and but but I had it down to a science in that I, for instance, when they came to the office, I always sat the woman at the head of the table, always. And I sat the man on the side looking at me. There was nothing behind him distracted. There's so much psychology that goes into that because if your viewers don't hear, remember anything else about today, remember this one thing. And anybody that's married or in a committed relationship understands this one concept, and that is women, all of us have absolute veto power. Mm. If we don't like you, (laughs) if we feel marginalized by you, okay, if we feel ignored by you, trust me, and I I came to this conclusion because I've been marginalized, I've been, Mm. you know, ignored in meetings with, they want to talk to my husband. I'm like, okay, let's see how this works out. (laughs) So I knew, I knew that by the time those women, when they got... But then that car door shut, okay, there was a decision made. Either she liked me or she didn't like me. Either she was disturbed or she wasn't. Even though she may not be the financial powerhouse, she is the ultimate, she, maybe not the decision maker, but she retains absolute veto power. Mm-hmm. And I think so many advisors, when they never hear from this prospect again, they have no clue. They have no idea that what she, what they did was they, they ignored, they marginalized her, they left her out of the conversation. They directed all of their stuff at him. And she's like, "Uh, we're done here. It's such a great point. I love the fact that you had to remove the background to keep the men from getting distracted. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, because men are like, you know, whatever. (laughs) This happened to my brother in real estate. We grew up with this family um, and went to church with them all growing up and all that stuff. Had a good relationship with them, knew their kids, everything. They called him uh, to come sell back, come back home about an hour from where he lives now to sell their home. He ended up doing all this work, not getting the listing. And pretty much it was that somehow he had rubbed the the wife the wrong way. Now he's still to this day, I told him, well, you're just oblivious. That's why, <laughs> but still to this day, but so it's so true in practicality. Like he had service wise done everything that Correctly. he thought he needed to do, yeah. but he had not made that person feel important. And the veto power is such a great way to say it. Uh, because you got to make sure they're recognized, especially in the financial services arena, like because the statistics are like freaking glaring. 70% of widows move their accounts yep. within, you know, like a year of their husband passing away or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's it's crazy from that perspective. I love that. I think that's an incredible point uh, to make. So let me ask you this, I guess, Aaron, is, you know, when you're looking at converting the client, and you go out and you do these lunches, you know, I think where a lot of people fall down is they fall down in how, like, when do I actually go for the clothes? And what if the lunch doesn't work? Like, what if I go out and I do the lunch, then I do the second lunch and I still don't earn a client? Like, how often should I, should I keep taking that person to lunch? Like, what's your opinion on that process on like how often you should be going after these clients? And, and what does that look like long term? Well, like I said, I would have lunch typically at some point, and, and then I would just ask, would you like to stay on my mailing list, right? Um, I really wanted, if I was with one person, my, my, my objective from the lunch was to get a meeting. And I felt like, you know, it's almost like the law of reciprocity because I'd given, I'd given them this gift of talking about themselves. It was very easy for them to agree to a meeting. Yeah, let me see if I can get my husband to come in. Because I'm a woman. I didn't, I didn't do, a, well, I shouldn't say that. It's probably equal, but I had to always be careful about going to lunch alone with men. Mm. I didn't want it to be misconstrued. Mis- so I had a lot, I was in a lot of women's groups. Now, the interesting thing about that is the women would bring their husband in. And this is a, another good tip for advisors, especially female advisor. I don't know, any advisor. She's sitting at the head of the table. He's over there. He comes in and he's got his arms crossed because he doesn't want to be there because he plays golf with his advisor every Saturday. He really doesn't want, you know, da 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 da. You know, he doesn't want to be there. So the one thing that I would do, I'd start off the meeting, and I just, and I didn't always do this, but if I saw, I can read body language like crazy. If I saw he was giving me that attitude, I would say, you know, before we get started, I just want you to both understand that in order to do business with my firm, it's not necessary that we manage all of your money. It is necessary that we know where the money is and how it's invested, so that we, we're not duplicating efforts or whatever. And I, like you said, I only said that if I saw that body language, but what's interesting, every time I said that, he'd go, oh, okay, <laughs> relax a I, little. I could listen to her. 
because now I wasn't a threat to his buddy, his golf buddy or whatever. So, I mean, just small little nuances like that. But if I could get them together, what I did, my the key was um, I started on the other side of the balance sheet. So there's the asset side and there's the liability side. And I call that the risk side. Now, you guys can obviously can imagine it's very easy for me to talk about risks. All I had to do is tell my personal story and I would stop and say, so, by the way, how much life insurance do you have on your life? <laughs> you know, and what about, you know, I mean, for me, I have an adult son. He's 35, 36. Gosh, I think it's my 37 this year. I'm getting old. But Kevin, when he was in the military, he did eight, excuse me, he did six deployments in eight years in, in the Air Force. He flew AC-130 gunships. Wow. Well, I had to think, you know, if he died, and God knows I prayed a lot during those deployments, the, the military gives him $400,000 of insurance. He had three kids, you know? And so we ended up putting $2 million of life insurance, term life insurance on my 35 year old time. He's 30 years old. Cause I'm like, I love my grandkids, but I don't want to move it in with me. Right. So I tell these <laughs> stories to my, I tell these stories to my prospects. And then I started thinking, what about my daughter-in-law? She stays home and she raises three kids. What would happen if she died? Now, he would still have to deploy to the Middle East. She doesn't have any life insurance on her own, so we put a million dollars on her. So when I can relate to, and so other, other people, other advisors don't have my rags to riches story or anything like that, but there are stories that happen in their practice. And so, like, I, I had a couple, that, you know, the first time I ever told my personal story was, I had been in business about three years. And up until this point, I wanted to I wanted to wear the diamond ring and I wanted everybody to think I was really successful. And I never wanted to talk about my story. And, you know, I wanted to be the Lottie Dog girl. And this couple came into my office and he had just retired from a pharmaceutical company. And they came in and they were just they were just distraught. And they're like, we were just getting ready to retire. And our son, he was involved in a motorcycle accident. He hit a guy on a motorcycle and now he's being. Um, oh my God. Wow. I'm thinking to my, I'm hearing this story. I'm hearing my story in front of me and I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not going to go there, you know? Mm. And, and there, but I could see they were just distraught and worried about their money. They're going to be sued because driving a car in their name. And, and all of a sudden I said, well, you know, I, I, I think I can relate. Mm. And I, I started sweating and I started, I, it was first time ever, 1992, I told my story. And these people, they literally leaped across the table and hugged me and they were crying because I could relate to what they were going through. And so the other piece of wisdom I want to give to advisors or whoever, this is a people business, mm. right? This isn't a money business, you know, investments and insurance, they're just, they're just tools, you know, like when you're a builder, you have a hammer and you have nails and you have wood. And so our business is not investments. Our business is people. Mm. And when you can relate on a personal level and you can show that you care and you've experienced life where you can relate to people, that's people by people. I mean, at least that's what I have found. So mm. yeah, that's so and we, we get wrapped, we get so wrapped up in the tools, the, the calendar charts and the money manager selection process and the money managers who completely miss the whole thing. I mm. love that. So let's talk about like, uh, let's go back and we we like to ask every guest um, kind of what would you go back and tell Aaron, you know, if you told your story, thank you for being open and vulnerable with that. But what would you go back and tell that younger Aaron, maybe that high school, college age, getting started off in your career in life? I would tell her that starvation is a wonderful motivator. Mm. And, and you know what? I kind of feel sorry for people who come into the business with like a silver linings, you know, whatever, the silver spoon in their mouth. Mm -hmm. I, I think the people who are really successful are people who have struggled or are willing to, like I said, I think starvation is the best motivator in the world. And believe me, I starved a lot. You know I mean? I, I had to work really hard for everything I got. And I would say that, you know what? eventually it's like creating momentum eventually things it's like a snowball right it that work that breakfast lunch cocktails dinners evening seminar all that stuff will pay off if nothing else like i wasn't closing people on the first meeting when i first started but i sure was the last 10 years it was really it was like my uh, challenge 
and everybody on my team knew it. My my team used to call my my conference rooms, they'd call it the web. And they'd say it's like a spider's web, Charlotte's web. Nobody gets out alive. Right? <laughs> so if I couldn't, if I if I couldn't close on the first time, first meeting with a couple, I, you know, then I knew I had failed. I had a skill set that needed to be improved. Wow. So the really cool thing now, rather than I mean, I did it by trial and error. I figured it out all on my own because there wasn't a lot of programs like I have. So now I just let people, I'm like, here, if you say these words they will say yes. Mm. So I love that mindset, that mentality of, of the spider's web. <laughs> so tell people about your coaching program. How can they learn more about it? Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to put a link up. It's um, aaronbosford.com slash elite. And it is a um, six month coaching program. And then people, I have a lot of uh, advisors who choose to stay on and become part of my quote inner circle and the inner circle. We meet once a month and we basically, cause the idea of these disturbing tracks, these 22 little lanes I go down to disturb people and I create that triggering event for them, that takes mastery. You don't learn that overnight. It took me 30 years to learn it. Mm. But now I have it down, but I can't feed that into your brain immediately. You have to actually go try it and see how you did and see how they responded. So so the course, the first course is a system. The first course is all on the mindset of achievement. Okay, because it's all up here. It's everything Paul taught me and how to think about the business and how to think about what I wanted out of the business. The other thing I will tell you this, I'm a big believer that the biggest problem with advisors and why they never reach, they, they all want to be top producers. They want to be Barron's top 100 producers, but they once they get to a level of comfort, they won't do what it takes to be for greatness, right? Mm -hmm. And so That's what I try and train them is, like I, you guys both know I have an orphanage. I actually support 500 children in Zambia that's all. Awesome. And that's the reason when I sold my company three years ago, I got a big check. Okay. I never had to, I never have to work again in my life, but I want, you know, to me, I want to, I never wanted to not do that. There's 1.7 million orphans in the country of Zambia alone. I, I take care of, I'm responsible for 500 of them. Mm. So by God, I have to get up every morning and I've got to make something happen. And what I try and encourage my students to do is think, you know, think of something larger than yourself. If, your entire universe is all about your own personal comfort. That's never going to be a big enough driver because it's easy in our country to get comfortable. So they ha so the first thing on mindset is get get where is it that you want to go? Drive yourself. Come up with that larger vision because there's a lot more kids that could use your help. If so, or something else, whatever drives you. The second thing is all is on um, prospecting and marketing. The third course is all, I call it my secret sauce. It's my 22 disturbing tracks. And that course alone takes six to eight weeks to go through. And I deliver it every week. I deliver, it's just an hour or two a week. And I really don't want them moving ahead because I want them to master what I've sent them. The fourth course is all about their team. I actually train your, their assistants. And I brought in my personal assistant, my best assistant I've ever had. And she and I created this course together. And then the last one we call the machine. And that is how to hire people, how to, Test people who, you know, who are you going to hire? What Colby score should they have? How to compensate them? You know, in 2015, guys, I took six months off and I did it on purpose because I really wanted to see what do I really have a business that can run without my day to day involvement? Mm. So I went to India for a month, Africa for a month, Asia for a month, and I took the summer off. And in 2015, my firm had a record year. And so, you know, I can, I, I can tell people the type of individuals you want to hire so that when you're away, the cats aren't playing. Mm. I can tell you how to compensate them to motivate them. So my courses, and we're always adding to the course too, as people say, what about this? What about that? Okay, let's add content because it's all up here. It's really hard to get it all from here into, into writing. That's fantastic. Give that URL one more time. It's www.aaronbotsford.com backslash, I think, elite. Awesome. awesome. And we're going to include that link and those resources in the show notes of this podcast, which you can get over at staypaidpodcast.com. Aaron, thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for listening. Uh, if you're interested in looking for ways to support the show, there's only two ways that we ask you to do that. First is to head on over to iTunes, leave a five-star rating, and then share this podcast with a friend. Today's, uh, this podcast featured review comes from our very own copywriter. Mm. So the person who puts together the show notes 
she went and gave us a review on she, iTunes. She loves this, which much? I love because it's actually like really sweet and genuine. And she always, yeah. you know, talks about how much she loves. <laughs> Look, she's listening to these guests and learning from them as yep. much as we are. So it's absolutely great. She says, "Freaking amazing podcast." So that's her title for the podcast. <laughs> if I had known about this podcast two years ago when she was a freelancer. I would probably still be a freelance copywriter instead of writing for Luke and Josh. Full disclosure, this is Gabrielle, and I work at Reminder Media. If you listen to the episode about how to write great email, emails, I'm the Gabrielle they mentioned. But truly, putting bias aside, this is a great podcast. Writing the emails and notes for the show, I must listen to each one at least three times. <laughs> uh, I, and every time I do, I find another gold nugget I wish I had known two years ago. So thanks, Gabrielle, for showing us that review. If you want to get hold of me or Luke, you can email us at podcast at remindermedia.com or you can find us on Instagram. We are at Stay Paid Podcast. For this episode of Stay Paid, I'm Joshua Stike. Guys, and I'm Luke Acree. And the action item from this, I mean, there's so many good lessons in there that you can take away from Aaron's journey. But I really feel like there's this theme woven in of story selling, storytelling. Like if you even go back and listen to this podcast and how she opened up the podcast with her story, and how that drew you in. And then when you think about it, when she actually goes and she actually does these disturbing tracks, as she calls them, she's really painting a picture. She's almost sharing a story of uh, getting them to think in their mind, what if this happened to me? And I think for all of us, it would be really, really powerful for you to look at your business and look at your presentation, whether in real estate, insurance, financial advising, and ask yourself, what's the story that you're telling? And what's the story that you're not telling? And in craft that narrative, craft that story, go check out Erin's stuff because I saw her on another webinar where she walks through some of these disturbing tracks and stuff. It's really, really powerful stuff. Just remember this, the difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer in every single business that Josh and I have worked in is top producers take action. So take action on that today. 